Hello and welcome to the Danfoss Drives Master Follower Application Webinar. My name is Lynn McCarthy. I'm the Marketing and Communication Specialist for Danfoss Turkey, Middle East and Africa. While we allow a minute or two for the rest of the audience to join us, I would love to cover some household and housekeeping rules. Um, please note that you will be muted by default but we encourage you to post your questions and comments in the chat box to your right. We will address all your questions at the end of this webinar. Please also note that this webinar will be recorded and you will be provided with a link to download the recording after we have concluded. Now, without further ado, I would love to introduce you to my co-presenters and organizers of the webinar, Mr. Stephen Brown and Mr. Bernard Galolo. Over to you, Bernard. Welcome. Hello to everyone, and uh, thank you, Lynn. I'm Bernard Galolo. I'm the Drive Sales Support Manager for Danfoss Drives in South Africa, and I'll be your co-host for today's webinar. I'll also like to introduce our presenter, that is uh, Mr. Stephen Brown, who is our business development manager at Danfoss in the mining section uh, for the Turkey, Middle East and Africa regions, also called uh, TMA. Mr. Brown has a very long relationship uh, with the mining industry, spanning around 38 years, of which he spent some good 10 years as an engineering official at Val Reefs. This is a gold mine situated in Orkney in the northwest province of uh, South Africa. Welcome, Mr. Brown, and please proceed with the webinar. Good day, everybody. Thank you, uh, Lynn Bernard, for the um, introduction. And welcome to everybody from what is quite a, this morning, quite a chilly um, South African morning. We're just starting to go into our winter, so it was quite cool this morning. Thank you for joining us. And um, we ran... Um, very briefly, we ran some webinars last year, some mining webinars uh, during the course of uh, the pandemic, because obviously we there was not a lot of um, availability for face-to-face -face meetings, etc. And by popular demand, we were asked to do some again this year. So we look for some uh, different subjects. So welcome to today's one, which is um, on uh, master follower application. Before we um, start into the webinar. Um, I'm just going to turn my camera off because I'm a bit worried about the bandwidth and we have some load shedding going on in South Africa at the moment. So um, I need to just turn my camera off, unfortunately. Otherwise, I might um, we might lose me. Okay, so... Okay, before we start the um, the webinar, I would like to ask my colleague Lynn just to quickly run a um, a poll that we put together. Lynn, if you could do that for me, please. Thank you, Steve. Um, we are running a multiple answer um, poll, and please feel free to participate. Nobody will know who chose which option. The question here is. Have you ever installed drives for master follower applications? A simple yes or no? Thank you. We see that half of you have made a selection. And I am going to close the poll and share the results. And 50% of our audience said yes, and the other half said no. So hopefully for the half that have not, this will be a very informative webinar. Over to you, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much for that, Lynn. So let's take a look at what we'll be looking at um, in today's presentation. Um, Apologies for those who have joined the webinars before, but we do have some new uh, registrants who are not fully aware of what Danfoss, uh, who we are, what we do, where we operate from. 
So just for their benefit, we'll just take a quick um, look at Dan Fawcett at glance. Then we'll look at the advantages of using uh, variable frequency drives on this types of applications. We'll take a look at some active load sharing and then the communication between the master follower scenarios uh, using analog output um, and input speed references, etc. And then how we can take this even further for uh, a better control by using encoder feedback. We'll look at a couple of um, applications on different types of the spectrum, spectrum on master follower uh, actual applications. Uh, one is a, um, a long conveyor and another one is a, um, a wet drive um, feeder. We'll then look at a conclusion with some key takeaways and then we will time permitting, which normally we do have a little bit of time at the end um, for us to take um, some of your questions. So Danfoss, who are we? What do we do? Where do we operate from? Well, our headquarters are in Nordborg in Denmark. We operate in all areas of the globe. As you can see there, Western, Eastern Europe, North America, the Asia Pacific, Latin America, um, Africa and Middle East and Lynn, Bernard and myself, we operate out of Johannesburg, South Africa. We have three main segments that we focus on. We used to have four um, because we used to have a cooling and a heating division that has now been combined and it forms what we call climate solutions. So the three segments now are drives where Bernard and myself uh, are installed, climate solutions and power solutions. And poor Lynn for all her sins has to look after all three. Bernard and myself, we're lucky. We only sit in the drive segment. We have five megatrends, quite important ones, that we're involved in, which is digitalization, electrification, urbanization, climate change, and very importantly, food supply. We have over 25,000 employees globally. It's actually sitting somewhere, I think, just over 27,000 at the moment. Now, last year, we obviously had the pandemic and a lot of businesses suffered and a lot of people got retrenched and laid off and businesses closed down. Danfoss have actually come out of this scenario quite successfully. And we foresee that by the end of this year or maybe next year, we'll actually be still even recruiting more um, employees. So we're actually seeing, we, we, we will actually see growth. We have 72 factory sites in more than 20 countries. And at the moment, we currently have 20% female leaders. We are targeting to increase this to 30% by the year 2025. We are hoping that the company becomes CO2 neutral by 2030. Um, it's a big ask. Um, I've worked for Danfoss for quite a number of years and knowing the, uh, the Danish and the Danish companies as I do, my prediction is that Danfoss will beat that, uh, but time will tell. Um, and just um, as a, a, a bit of a sideline to, to that as well, um, because the the Danes are very much into um, securing um, our sort of life expectancies and also with the climate, they're very much into doing everything they can to reduce this. Um, and Denmark actually, as one of the most aggressive climate plans put forward by any country, because it's aiming to reduce its emissions by, um, 70% of its 1990 carbon levels within 10 years. So to do that for the Danes, is, it means removing an estimated 20 million tons of carbon from the actual current emissions. And because of this, obviously the world's recognizing that the recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic, it must be green and sustainable. And Danfoss is, is now perfectly positioned to take a leading role in, the, in what we call the global green transition that is happening right now. Now, Danfoss has signed 
the United Nations Global Compact on Social and Environmental Responsibility. And our companies, wherever we operate in the, in the world, we do act responsible towards any local laws, structures that may be in place in any part of the world. Now, variable speed drives um, are actually becoming the uh, starter of, more and more so, the starter of choice. And it's not only in applications that require speed control, but also in those applications that also require torque control. And you'll see that as we go through the presentation. And also the mechanical soft starting and conveyor belt um, application would be one such um, example. So smoothly controlling the acceleration and deceleration of long conveyors, it reduces mechanical stress through all the drive frame components and actually within the conveyor belt itself. So this, what does it do? Well, it leads to a longer lifetime for the belt and the other drive components. So what does that do? Well, it increases your asset availability and it lowers your maintenance and operating costs. So having that flexibility to control the speed of long conveyors can actually help optimize the whole complete system it can reduce your bottlenecks and it actually maximizes the efficiency of a, of a material flow process, which then in turn results in operating cost savings. It, it's common practice to install multiple motors on long conveyors and the, the drives need to ensure load sharing between each motor for a reliable operation and to maximize this um, belt life. The, the VLT and the Varcon drives include both what we call master master and what we're going to look at today is the master follower control solutions for this. Selection of the control solution depends on the configuration of the conveyor drives on the conveyor. So for example, all the drives at the head end or drives at both the head and the tail end. Ultimately, the conveyor belt starting system required for any given conveyor application, well, that needs to be defined by the conveyor designer and it needs to take many variables into consideration, such as um, variable speed versus fixed speed. What is the conveyor geometry? Is it uphill, downhill? Is it flat? Is regenerative braking required or not? Is there any load sharing requirements? And also many other factors that have to be taken into consideration. They're both easy to implement on the, 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 the Varcon and the, the, v, the VLT and the Varcon. They're both easy to implement and have proven to be robust, reliable solutions for long conveyors. Now for downhill conveyors, where continuous regenerative braking operation is sort of typically required, uh, an active front end drive or alternatively a regenerative drive panel type solution using a what we call a standard six pulse drive with a separate regenerative module is usually the best solution. So any decision can then be based on the system that provides the best balance of performance under all these belt type conditions. Also taking cost optimization, including capital cost and energy costs, and also very importantly, reliability, um, especially for those of us that have worked in the mining industry, such as I did. I mean, reliability, I mean, it, it, it is, um, how can we put it? It, it? It's very important to people working on the mine because I, for one, did not want to get called out at two o'clock in the morning to go and have to fix fix problems out on the out on the mine. Now the main challenge for the designer is that the starting system must um, it it has to produce enough torque to get the belt load away. Why do I say that? Well. Quite often, and especially in South Africa today with the load shedding, it could be that the 
conveyor belt could stop under under full load conditions. Now I've seen in the past on the mine I worked on where this has happened and then they've had to get people um, at to the site, they've had to offload all the ore that's on the on the belt, start the um, belt up because it can't start under full fully loaded conditions and then load the ore back onto the onto the belt. It's time consuming, it means production is 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 being lost, which means um, the the uh, monetary uh, turnover for the actual company is being lost. So it doesn't only have to produce enough torque to get the, the belt load away, but at the same time, it needs to apply this torque in a smooth and controlled manner to limit the negative mechanical impacts, the, the effects of a, a high impact acceleration, because you don't want it to shoot off and then the belt to snap. Again, it, it's, it, it's, it's going to cost a lot of money to be repaired. So you need that control to be able to start the, the conveyor. And then obviously, protect, as I've just mentioned, basically protection against a belt jam is also important. So this talk needs to be limited in case of a failure. Now, the VLT and Varcon drives are used extensively on many long conveyors in quite often in excess of one kilometer in length. And these are quite common on bulk material applications on, on a lot of mine sites processing plants and port facilities. Um, areas that I can think of off the top of my head is um, run of min bin feeder conveyors, uh, you could get it in stockyards, train loadout conveyors, pipe conveyors, and long overland um, conveyors. And long overland conveyors in South Africa, we have a lot of the long overland, in, especially in the coal mining industry. So if we take a look at this slide, uh, the variable speed drive has the capability to perform active load sharing between what we, is multiple motors on the on the same conveyor. So you can see here we've got on the, the head and the tail end. So one variable speed drive assumes the function of the master and the other function as followers. The master variable speed drive sends its actual speed to the follower, which the follower then uses as its speed reference. So not only does it send that, it also sends its actual torque to the follower, which the follower uses as its torque producing current limit setting. So in this way, as the master's torque increases, then the follower's torque limit increases as well. So it, what does that mean? Well, it, it means it allows it to contribute more torque to the load. And then the same in reverse, as the master's torque decreases, the follower's torque limit also decreases. So it allows it to contribute less torque to the load. So in this way, an even load sharing is, meant, is maintained between uh, multiple parallel VFDs on the uh, variable speed drives on the same load. And this sharing can be fine-tuned through what we call PID loops to obtain an accurate sharing of torque within a, a, a small bandwidth So let's look at the analog output input speed reference, which I've made a mention of. Well, the, the speed reference from the, from the master, it, it can be, a, a, usually it's usually just a simple analog output based on output frequency. This analog signal is then fed down into the, what we call the follower drives. And this methodology allows what we call open loop variable speed drives to be used and it, it will be the most cost effective. However, there is a downside where the response might lag from the master to the follower. And this lag will actually increase as more axes are added. So additionally, without the use of an encoder, you're not getting any feedback from the follower to correct any, any potential motor slip and variable loading. So this method should really only be considered for what we would call low dynamic systems that can tolerate more following error.
So what do we have with open loop with a challenge as well? Open loop talk control. So remember, this is without what we call encoders. It relies on the calculation of the master talk and the follower talk based on the what the motor model is and what the current measurement is. So if we want to have better control, closed loop talk control, that provides a, a, a lot more accurate control, a lot more accurate measurement of the motor torque due to the motor torque versus the slip. In other words, you get an almost linear characteristic, and that's because with an encoder, you get feedback direct from the, from the motor. So as I've said previously, on startup of long conveyors, tension, uh, we have to be very careful. We have to start up and ramp up slowly. Um, because the tension typically has an oscillating frequency, but what we're showing here is approximately 0.1 hertz in this example. So this translates into an oscillating torque on the motors. So any master follower solution, open or, or, or closed loop, uses a second order controller. So in other words, speed and torque, which has to be tuned correctly. In other words, slow PID, because we want to stop the to avoid those the, the motors oscillating with the with the load. As we've mentioned, how can we get the control? How can we get better control? Well, we use encoders. So improved speed regulation can be achieved by adding motor feedback. We do this by the use of an encoder. Then the master, then that provides a speed reference signal to the follower through what we call a buffered TTL, which is a transistor-transistor logic signal. And this requires closed loop drives with an encoder card. So you have to have an encoder card fitted into the drive, but the result is going to be a much tighter, better control, better speed regulation. So here, we what we're showing is the motor and uh, motor one and the master drive what that does it sends a reference signal using one of its analog outputs which i've already mentioned to the follower one which is motor two and then monitors that monitors the 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 signal which is the 4 to 20 milliamp signal from the master it uses its analog input and this same arrangement is then copied between the, uh, the second and third motors, as we're showing here. And the greatest variance between drives, it, it's usually around 0.3 hertz along the entire range of frequencies. So say from two to 60 hertz, when using that um, four to 20 milliamp analog signal. It is possible with the Danfoss drives to use a digital output as the reference simulating a, a pulsed out, output similar to the signal coming from an encoder. The follower uses a digital input then to follow this pulse reference signal. So the, the greatest variance between the drives using the pulse signal is around 0.2 hertz along the entire range of frequencies, again, um, two to 60 hertz. However, there's an additional time delay in this arrangement. The master drive what you will find it starts going to its reference before it sends the signal to the follower drives and usually this delays it, it's usually very small it's, it's actually milliseconds but it can have a very harmful effect on if you've got certain exact processes that are required so it can have a harmful effect on that and this delay is referred to as a propagation delay so what do I mean by propagation delay? Well, that's typically, it refers to the, the rise of time or the fall time in logic gates. It's the time it takes for a logic gate to change its output state based on a change on the input state. And this occurs due to the inherent capacitance in the logic gate. So what are factors that can affect, affect the propagation delay? Well. It can be the weights measured, the amount of overdrive, the, the supply voltage, the output driver supply voltage, capacitive loading, common mode voltage, the configuration, in other words, is it inverting or non-inverting, 
of the edge on which one measures, is it rising or falling? And also temperature can have effect on it. How can we reduce that? Well, the effect of our higher value current pulses, it's, that's to reduce the circuit delay through the buffer. Also, the, the pulse width um, can be designed as, as temperature sensitive and also supply voltage sensitive, so as to maintain the, the buffet circuit delay as substantially constant as temperature, supply voltage and process variation occurs. So the different types, so we'll just look at a couple. Um, there's different implementations of master follower arrangements, but let me give you a run through a couple of some of the most common applications. Load sharing, talk sharing, which you've heard me mention. Talk sharing is also possible with uh, master follower arrangements. And talk sharing is, it might be designed as a way to distribute the talk and, and work through different tr drive trains and motors. In the normal operation, the drives and motors, they actually share the load, resulting in uh, less heating and wear on the mechanical components, as I've mentioned before. However, if one drive does fail and the other axis is able to drive to a safe location or operate at a reduced state temporarily. So you may want to completely stop the application or like a conveyor, you may need it to run to a certain point before it actually comes to a, to a, 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 a stop. So in other words, to a standstill. Now for load sharing applications, it's, it, it, it's better to assign what we call slightly different torque values for the master and follower. Um, in other words, if you put them the same, they, they have a potential to fight each other. So we don't want that to happen so that, so that they're not fighting each other. We, for example, might set to regulate at 51% of the torque command, whereas the follower axes might, we might set that at 49% of the torque command. Uh, basic load sharing applications, you know, like fans, pumps, can be achieved economically with using one drive and multiple motors. And in addition to improve speed regulation performance, one advantage with a, a torque sharing methodology is that the drive can be used to detect overloads and also your motor sizes can be different. They don't have to be the same size. Speed velocity following, so in this application, it could be a user wants multiple motors to run at the same speed or perhaps a scaling of each other. So here the master operates in velocity control mode and it typically has some sort of system feedback. It could be a pressure sensor or here we can use a motor encoder feedback. What happens then is the master then outputs a speed reference command to one or more of the follower drives. If the different drive axes are geared differently, then the follower speed command might be a scaled version of the master speed command. And it's also possible to apply a speed offset. But the important thing to note in speed following mode is that the drives are always trying to regulate the instantaneous speed command. So if there was a following error that happens in, or has happened in the past, the follower drive just tries to correct to the speed set point but doesn't comp compensate for any accumulated error. So briefly, we'll just run through what we've basically discussed. Common applications in mining and mineral processing and bulk material handling. Various configurations um, can be um, installed. Again, depends on the conveyor design. We've mentioned long overland conveyors, trough belt conveyors, pipe conveyors, underground conveyors can have this type of application. It's, it's all uh, quite capable of landing this application. What are the benefits? Well, we've mentioned before controlled acceleration, deceleration, which reduces the mechanical stress. This gives you a longer belt lifetime. So what does that mean? Well, it means you increase your asset availability and you have lower operating costs. You also have better efficiency, um, which gives you lower operating costs because the, the drive will detect the loading on the conveyor because you don't have to run a, a conveyor may 
during the course of the day may not want to run at um, full speed um, throughout, uh, so basically 100% all of the time. You may be able to run it at 50% during sort of off-peak times, so your drive will help reduce your energy costs. What are the typical sizes for a for this type of application? Well, the, the typical ones we find are usually in the region of 200 to one, 200 kilowatts to 1.5 megawatts. Yes, we know we do get um, some that will uh, be slightly larger, and you can you can get some that are slightly under the 200 kilowatt. But the majority we found are within within that 200 to 1.5 megawatt, megawatt bandwidth. Application requirements, well, we're sharing the load between the motors, so providing total power torque required with minimum stretch in the conveyor belt. Remember, we don't want to stretch the belt so that it breaks. What does that do? It gives us a longer belt lifetime. And then dynamic braking, well, that depends on the design, um, often controlled deceleration, not requiring dynamic braking. Uh, to minimise the stretch forces in the conveyor with the electromechanical um, type brake systems. And just to recap, master drive control, it's controlled in a, a speed, in speed control mode, master torque transmitted to the follower drives, and the follower drives controlled in a torque control mode. So let's look at um, a couple of applications. This um, is a conveyor, overland downhill conveyor in uh, China from a um, cement plant, for a cement plant. You can see it had seven different segments to it. Segment one was just direct online. Segment two was uh, 90 kilowatt motors uh, plus uh, VLT drives. The third segment was 355 kilowatt motor and uh, again a, a VLT drive. Segment four, there was two 315 kilowatt motors. They were at different locations along this conveyor and two of these VLTs um, were um, apply, applied as load sharing. Segment five, uh, again, two 315 kilowatt motors at different locations along the conveyor and again two of those VLTs had load sharing. The sixth segment was 355 kilowatt motor and a VLT and then segment seven two four hundreds with uh, at different locations along the conveyor and again we had load sharing between two of those two of them. I now want to show you a short video um, it, actually on this application. So let me just go into this. And let me play you the video. Shangxi Shangxi Cement in West China uses load sharing between Danfoss VLT drives to transfer energy from downhill segments to other parts of the belt conveyor system. The system has the capability to recuperate energy due to power region units provided by Danfoss and partners, minimizing the consumed power. The arrangement of the conveyor segments enables the downhill segments to generate power, supplying the uphill parts of 10.5 km conveyor system transporting limestone to Shangxi's cement plant. Satisfied customer states, Shangxi Shangxi Cement finds the Danfoss solution perfect. It works really well and uses minimal energy. Uh, 
Okay, so hopefully the video played okay and uh, everybody could hear it and there was no problems with the um, with the bandwidth. So quite an interesting um, application. So let's look at another um, application. Like I said, it's it's we're looking at two sort of different ends of the spectrum because you saw on the the long conveyor from Shenxi Shongxi, um, quite a large high power drives. We're now going to look at one with low, what we would call the lower power drives. Um, it was a wet screw feeder, quite a complicated application actually, uh, but very interesting. And it was a wet screw feeder that was developed for this plant. Uh, due to the un un what was very unusual characteristics of the material being processed, it was from uh, what we call PGMs, platinum group metals, in other words, platinum chrome base metals. The material was, it, it, it was actually extremely sticky. It was pretty much similar in construction to clay and it needed to be transferred into a dryer. So in addition, um, this material was to be received not only from mines within the immediate area, but it also had to be transported from mines in the, what we call the Mpumalanga province of South Africa, which is a distance of over 300 kilometers away. And during this transit period, the plant had found that some composites, it varied because some dried out while other materials re actually remained wet. Now, from a mechanical design perspective, the gears required for the, for the feeder, they would be actually quite large scale, and that posed some really practical challenges when it came to physically fitting um, this into the unit, um, into the unit synchronization without the screws clashing. So, Larger gears would obviously substantially increase the cost of the wet screw feeders. And then one of the client's other requests was ease of, ease of maintenance, which was obviously a further requirement by the, by the actual end user for the plant. The throughput needed for the first wet screw feeder was between 30 and 40 tons per hour. And then with the second one, it was a bit, little bit less. It was 15 tons per hour required for that one. A trial machine was built for testing of the application and a three screw shaft solution was found to be the most effective. So while the three screw shafts were mechanically linked to one another during this trial, the client actually favored a solution with independent shafts controlling a, a 22 um, kilowatt motor uh, it was a, a 22 kilowatt motor gearbox combination on each shaft with electronic synchronization um, sitting between them. And this was actually a, a critical requirement as all three shafts needed to rotate in a coordinated manner to help prevent mechanical damage. So you can imagine if they've got three screws turning and they go out of sync, you can imagine that they will um, actually mesh together and just disintegrate the whole three shafts. So as I said, this, this was due to the fact that should any of the shafts go out of sync, even by a programmable limit, the, the machine must actually come to a stop. So how do I mean by that? Well, for example, if one of the motors, gearboxes or shafts became overloaded and slowed the motor down, it had to be detected by an out of synchronization function and all the screw shafts had to stop. And once the problem had been cleared and the application had been brought back manually, then the application had to revert back into the correct synchronized pos position automatically when started, instead of having to return the shaft to a home position manually. Now, during normal operation, the load on each drive is it's actually relatively light. It's sort of at less than 50% motor full load torque. But because of that material's consistency, there are times that we found when higher loads occur. And it was for this reason that the, 
22 kilowatt drives with 22 kilowatt motors were put forward and this is now proven to be especially true during start conditions or low what we call low feed rate conditions the motors are actually mounted above the gearbox driving each screw shaft which means that the motor drives the gearbox via a belt drive they actually needed the flexibility to be able to adjust the belt pulley ratio during commissioning in order to set the maximum speed and therefore the throughput rate of the feeder and this also prevented mechanical damage as the belt would fail first the final application setup comprises of three screws connected to the 22 kilowatt motors and reducing gearboxes the master or the the center motor is attached to a danfoss vlt fc302 automation drive with a profi buzz and here we did use uh, encoder options the profi buzz master is the is the plant control system controlling the operation speed of the motor according to process requirements and the master motor is fitted with an encoder to increase its dynamic torque response and the shaft of this motor has a reference encoder to measure the actual screw shaft rotational speed so the higher the the ppr in other words the pulse per revolution the better the sinking as the increments are closer to each other thus this increases the resolution of the feedback so in this application we used 8192 ppr multi-turn absolute encoders and when the wet feeder needs to run it gives a start command to the master variable speed drive via its profi buzz comms and the master vsd then gives the start signals to the follower uh, variable speed drives the two follower screws are connected to Danfoss VLT FC302 automation drives with what we call an MC3, uh, MCO350 synchronizing controller option. That's also with Profibus, but this is only for monitoring purposes in this case and not control. The master encoder is connected to both the MCOs as a master reference, which means that the MCO350 cards fitted into the drive monitor the speed of the master shaft the follower encoder is fitted on the on um, onto the screw shaft and the <coughs> excuse me and the these encoders are then connected um, to each respective mco as a feedback signal the way this operates is that the follower effectively it actually mirrors the master encoder and if the master and i'll i'll come to the next slide which will um i'll just point out on a scope reading so if the master screw shaft runs at a certain speed the follower mco card monitors that speed and matches it so that the follower shaft is running in sync with the master reference if the application does stop in an alarm state all the motors will coast to a stop and the follower shafts will be out of sync now if a start command is given the master variable speed drive has a five second delay so that the screws will ramp up and the application goes back into sync by itself the master will then ramp up to the speed reference as per the profibus signal and again if any maintenance has been done on the application remember then the screws would again come out of sync so a manual sync was programmed so that the variable speed drives would go into a second setup and now each screw can actually be jogged in a forward and reverse to put all the screws back into a sync position and once the screws are correctly aligned you can push the sync button and the variable speed drive will have a new zero position the application can then be started up again and can run in sync the fact that the danfoss um, MCO350 option did not require, you know, because you can write um, special info to that card, it didn't re require automatic positioning programming. It was also a significant deciding, deciding factor for the end user. Okay, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but if you look at the red line and the pink line, this is what I was talking about where the master. Um, well, well, should I say the follower is actually mirroring the master speed. 
So you can see, it's just basically a mirror image. What about um, difference in motors with the Danfoss drives? Well, each Danfoss or Varken drive is configurable. It's compatible and efficiently, efficiency optimized for all typical motors. So what does that mean? Well, it liberates you from the performance and price restrictions of bundled motor drive package deals. You can use a Danfoss drive with any, any motor. Can we support the product? Yes, of course we can. Uh, we've got what we call Drive Pro. Uh, these services are designed to help you get the most out of your applications, assisted by Danfoss VLT and Varcon drives. We actually go beyond the simple device maintenance, repairs and replacements. We proactively offer you added value that directly improves your business. And our comprehensive portfolio of services that spans the entire life cycle of your drives. It's based on extensive experience and expertise. Um, these services are customized to your requirements whenever and wherever you may need them. And we've actually made it our business to understand your applications, your industry, your business and you. And we have Drive Pro partners, so if anybody's considering doing a master follower application and they need assistance, we have Drive Pro partners that have done quite a number of these installations. Contact us and we'll be happy to assist. And I'm sure they would be happy to assist and, and come and help you do the actual setup. Danfoss does offer free training, um, online training. If anybody's inter interested, uh, please contact us. Contact um, either Lynn, Bernard or myself, and we'll be happy to guide you in the, in the right direction. In 2015, Danfoss acquired uh, Varcon Drives. So by doing that, it gave us access to active front end and also now to medium voltage drives. So the combined VLT and Varcon product portfolio, it means we can address all your low voltage variable speed application needs in the mining and minerals industry. And also now we can um, cover um, with, the, with, the media, with the medium voltage drives as well. What are the key takeaways from this presentation? Well, as we said, less heating and wear stresses on mechanical components. It means they'll last longer. It means it's the be more reliable, they'll work longer periods of time and it's uh, cost saving. Energy saving because you don't need to, the, the motors don't need to run at full speed all the time. So uh, you can have energy savings because the conveyor may only need to run at 50% during off peak periods. So what does that mean? It means you get cost savings now and into the future. Lynn, before we go into questions, could I ask you to please assist me by running the second poll, please? Sure, Mr. Brown. Thank you for that informative presentation. Um, I invite the audience now to participate in another poll. The question here is, do Dunfoss drives 90 kilowatt above have a back channel cooling feature? A simple yes or no option. The responses are coming in quickly. I'll give it two or three more seconds. And I'm going to close the poll. And let's share the findings. And everybody that voted said yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, Bernard, um, would you like to go ahead with any questions that we may have had? Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm uh, having a look at the chat box, and uh, it appears that there is no question that has been posted. Um, just one comment that I want to make, it's uh, regarding uh, the um, uh, uh, master follower on uh, Vacon drives that uh, it's possible on uh, different protocols uh, apart from uh, the uh, analog uh, wiring on drive to drive we can also do on uh, different uh, uh, ethernet and profibus and profinet all those options are available as the uh, Danfoss drives are much configurable on the VLT and also on Vacon. 
Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, one question that I did see come up was, what does uh, PID stand for? Well, that's proportional integral derivative. The uh, built-in PID uh, controller eliminates the need for auxiliary control devices and maintains constant control of, of a closed-loop system where regulated pressure, flow, temperature, as I mentioned before, or other system requirements must be maintained. And the drive can use two um, feedback signals from two different devices, uh, allowing the system to be regulated with different feedback requirements. Um, the drive mix then makes control decisions by comparing these two signals to optimize the, the system performance. That was the one that I did see. Um, okay, if there's no um, further questions, Lynn, would you like to um, uh, close the meeting for us? Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, having some issues closing the poll, technical issues, these things happen. Um, thank you, Mr. Brown and Bernard for this informative uh, presentation and Bernard for addressing the questions. Now that we've come to the end of the webinar, we hope that you've enjoyed the session and that you will join our future webinars. Um, just a reminder, after closing of this uh, session, you will get a link to download the recording of this webinar and you will have a quick poll uh, if you wish to participate. And thank you and goodbye from my side. Yes, yeah, thank you from my side as well. And if anybody's interested, the next webinar will be on the 7th of July. It is on the medium voltage uh, drives and we will have a guest speaker from um, the United States. So it's on the 7th of July at 2 p.m. in uh, Central African time. In, uh, so it's 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Central African time. Everybody, thank you for your attention. Um, please stay safe, look after yourselves until next time. So goodbye from all of us. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you and goodbye.